Let's pray and ask our teacher to come today. Um, I hope you didn't come just to hear me because I may disappoint you. But one thing I've learned about the Lord, he has more than any of us can ever dream of. Amen. Amen. He has an abundance. He has a great abundance. Father, we just welcome our teacher, the Holy Spirit, here this morning. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would not only give me words to say and fill my mouth and fill my heart, but to open the ears of every seeker. Open the ears. You said, Lord, that if we would desire truth, if we would seek you with our whole hearts, that you would come and you would answer. You make yourself real to us. And we pray that happens today in the dimension and the realm of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you open the eyes of our understanding, open the ears of our hearing, And open our hearts to receive and comprehend and that we may receive impartations from you today. That we'll leave here not with just mere human intellectual things or emotional stimulation. But we'll leave here with a spiritual illumination. That truth will truly manifest inside of us. Jesus, you said in your word, in the great prayer that you prayed for your disciples... Thy word is truth. Make them to know truth. Thy word is truth. And I pray that the word of God would be revealed and exalted above all human opinion, above all human speculation, above all human reasoning this morning. Let your word prevail. And let your word be exalted above every thought and intent of our human hearts. And we make that decision to cast down vain imaginations and today bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ we'll not let our brains run wild but we'll bring them under the discipline and the power of the word and the spirit of God this we commit to do Jesus as your disciples because you've called us to a higher life you've called us to walk in the light and to get away from the darkness And we make this commitment in our lives to do this. And that's why we assemble here today, Lord, into your name. And that's why we ask for your spirit to help us. Because this is more than human effort. This is a divine intervention. Lord, thank God that you intervened in our lives. And even when we didn't seek you, you sought us. And we thank you today that we've been not only called but chosen. And you've called each of us in this room this morning by name, and you've called us to assemble, and you've called us to learn your ways. And so we submit our hearts, our souls, our minds, our bodies. We submit ourselves to you today, spirit of truth. Thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement with that, just shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That means so be it. Sometimes people come into church and they don't even know what words mean. So we give definition. The word amen means so be it. I want that to be done in my life. There's a very powerful thing when we all come into an agreement of so be it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. John chapter 3, we're, we're doing this series. I'm just calling it the supernatural church. We use that word a lot. You see that word a lot in in culture today, the supernatural. There was another word that used to be used a lot, and it was called spiritual. The word spiritual and the word supernatural are really synonyms because they're speaking of another dimension that's outside of the physical dimension. When you think of spirit, the Bible says God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth but then you also think of the word supernatural again this is something outside of the dimension of the five senses It's something that we can't physically hold in our hands or even see under a microscope but it happens and Jesus you know the very familiar scripture in John chapter 3 when he was confronted by this religious leader named Nicodemus. And he came to him by night. He said, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the signs you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of spirit and of water, or water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And you know, one of the evidences of being born of the Spirit is people look at you and they think, what in the world? Where are you coming from and where are you going? Because you're no longer walking simply by Mere human intellect, mere human reasoning. Now you're walking by a divine intervention in your soul. Now you're walking by a spiritual force that is beginning to call you and, and ask you to do different things. And out of that new birth comes the power of God. And in Acts chapter 1, which we looked at, Acts chapter 2, and into Acts chapter 3, we see the birth of the early church. We see the Holy Spirit being poured out. To where this scripture was now being fulfilled. And we're going to pick up this morning in Acts 2.36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus. Whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren what shall we do? You know, whenever someone hears the truth of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes in and they are condemned a sinner and they know they have to have a salvation, they know that they've got to have an intervention, then what happens is we say, what do we do? And so Peter answered and said, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise and if you go back and you trace what we call the promise of the Father all the way from the Gospels all the way up through Acts. The promise of the Father, Jesus said, is what you heard from me. For truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts. Jesus told him, you shall be endued with power from on high. And, and, and so that happened on the day of Pentecost. And now Peter says this promise, this promise of an endowment of supernatural power and strength is to you. It's to your children. Many churches teach today that stopped. No, it didn't. Amen. It's to you and to your children. Amen. It even goes on to say to as many who are afar off. Well, we qualify right there. We're, we're probably 10,000 miles from Jerusalem right now. As many as the Lord God shall call. Jesus never said this stops when Paul dies. Jesus never said only this first generation of disciples will be empowered with the Holy Spirit. He said this is for everybody. And Peter made it very clear. We all should have an expectation of an impartation of divine strength, divine gifts, the empowerment of God. All of us, people in this world who knew us before we were born again should be looking at us saying, what happened to you? If there's no difference, I would have to question your salvation. Amen. If there's no difference in you before you accept Christ and after, I would have to question the legitimacy of that new birth. I would need to see some evidence, some kind of a birth certificate. You know, we all in this room have birth certificates. It's evidence we were born where we were born. And the birth certificate is the Holy Spirit. He's called the guarantee. He's called the guarantee. And that gift of faith that he brings into our hearts is the title deed of our salvation. And so we walk in that warranty. Now, this morning we're going to begin to a discourse on going through and explaining how the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifest in different people. You know, one thing we have as a fallacy as human beings is we have this tunnel vision. And everyone in this room has this tunnel vision. And this tunnel vision is, I think I'm right. Amen. 
I think I'm right. You're only doing things this morning because you think you're right. The Bible gives a very strong answer and says the way of every man is right in his own eyes. We all think we're right. We all have that in common. And many things you are right about, but not everything. Amen. There are some things you're different than I am. And there are some things I'm different than you are. And where human beings fail, especially in the church, is instead of celebrating our differences, we don't like it. I don't like him. He's not like me. Well, thank God. You as, we can only handle about one of you. Turn around your neighbor and just say, we can only handle one of you. And then you say back, well, we can only handle about one of you too. Maybe that's why God only made one of us, because he knew the world couldn't handle two of you. Amen. But what an immature thing not to be able to celebrate the diversity in the body of Christ and the different gifts and the different operations and the different manifestations. So many people want everybody to think like they do. Stop it. Amen. You're really not all that. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, say, you're not all that. <laughs> you're just part of that. I'm not the body of Christ. I'm just one little piece of it. Amen. Amen. The world doesn't revolve around me. Hallelujah. Man, we got to celebrate the diversity of what God is calling us to be and to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Translation this morning. We'll have it on the screen there in case um, you, know, you, you may have a different translation. Now about the spiritual gifts, verse 1. The special endowments of supernatural energy, brethren. I don't want you to be misinformed. I don't want you to be misinformed. You know that you were heathen. You were led off after idols that could not speak habitually as impulse directed and whenever the occasion might arise. You know, I've, I've only been in one pagan temple and, and where there was an idol. I've only experienced that once in my life. It was in Thailand, in Bangkok, Thailand, and I went to the Buddhist temple and there was a big concrete Buddha. They called it the Lying Buddha. You could go to another temple in Bangkok, the Standing Buddha. They had the Sitting Buddha. But one thing about it is I walked in, that idol didn't say a word. The idol didn't do anything for me. It was a piece of concrete. But people sit around and worshipped it. So in Thailand today and in other nations, they're still bowing down and worshipping dumb idols. I mean, we have churches in America where people have little trinkets, little statues of Paul, and they're praying to that little statue. In, in, in one church, in, it, they have paintings on the wall, and they pray to the paintings on the wall. That's a heathen practice. That's why one of the first commandments God gave the human race is do not make any graven image. Why did God say that? Because he knew us, and he knew what we'd do. We'd start praying to a statue of something that's human nature but God says he's not made with our hands and you can't carve him and you can't paint him and he said this is the way you guys were before but he said now we're, we're different you were heathen but I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God can ever say Jesus be cursed and no one can really say Jesus is my Lord except by the and under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Now notice he said no one can really say it. You can say it and not mean it. You can say it and not mean it. You know, I've been ministering before to people who were demon possessed. And when that demon was manifesting in them, you would say, say this. And they couldn't say it. They couldn't really say it. And so there is a power of the Holy Spirit that bears witness in our hearts that Jesus is the Son of God and that Jesus is Lord of all. And if you're saying that this morning, if you're in this room, how many in this room would actually say to me, I believe Jesus is Lord of all? If that's you, lift your hand right now and say, that's me. Okay, now here's the beauty of it. You could not do that without the Holy Spirit. Not really. Now, how do you know if you're really saying it or if you're just saying it? Well, 
if you, if you say it and then you don't do it, then we know you're not really doing it. But when you're doing it, you're living according to that truth. Now we know it's real. Amen. You're not just, as the Bible says, hearers of the word, foolish people, but you're doers of the word. You're wise people. Amen. So it goes on to tell us now, there are distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments, gifts, extraordinary powers, distinguishing certain Christians. Due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit, and they vary. Everybody say, they vary. They vary. That means all kinds of different ways. But he says it's the same Holy Spirit. He remains the same. Amen. He has different ways he moves through people. He has all different kinds of endowments, extraordinary powers, but they vary. And there are distinctive varieties of service and administration, but it is the same Lord who is served. And there are varieties of operation of working to accomplish things but it is the same God who inspires and energizes them all in all here we see the fullness of the Godhead this, there are diversities of gifts the same spirit there are diversities of ministries the same Lord and then there's operations the same God who works on us. So we see God the Father as the overseer of the operation. We see God the Son as the distributor of the ministry gifts. In Ephesians 4 we see he gave some apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher for the equipping of the saints. For them. And then we see God the Holy Spirit manifesting in his gifts. So we see the Godhead working in perfect unity to accomplish the mission and to accomplish the goal of what God had intended from before the foundation of the world. And they're not in competition with one another. Amen. Jesus said that the works he did, he did because the Father told him to do them. And then he said, the works I do, the Spirit does on me. So he gave credence, he gave credit to the Father and he said, I only do what the Father tells me to do, operations. He's the overseer. And then I am come to be the apostle of your faith. I, I've come to distribute these ministry gifts. But the Holy Spirit on me, he does the manifesting power. He's the one that makes these things manifest on earth. The miracles are working by his power. And so we see God manifesting in the earth. It's sad when the church says, well, we're going to, first of all, believe in God. That's cool. But then secondly, the church eliminated three out of five gifts that Jesus gives. They say they're no longer apostles. And there are no longer prophets. And in some, they, they only give evidence of two gifts, pastor and evangelist, and then some teacher, three gifts. But Jesus gave the church all five gifts. And we need all five to survive. Everybody say it with me. It takes five, it takes five. To, survive. to survive. Five is the number of grace and goodness. Five is the number of grace and goodness. It is by grace God gave the church these manifestations. Now most people have their favorite gift. Most people have their favorite gift. You know, we have different people speak at different times here. And some people say, well, man, I just love it when Pastor Dave speaks. You know, I just love his gift. And, and, and in fact, if I find out he's not speaking, I'm not even coming to church today. Because he's not speaking. Someone else is speaking. I'm only one part of five. But to have a diet. You know, we had a family uh, left the church in Columbus because they didn't like Pastor Brian. He's an evangelist. And that was one of the reasons they said we're leaving the church because he preaches there once a month and we don't like him. They said we like the teaching of the word and he just encourages and exhorts and gets the sick healed. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we're sorry he's doing all them horrible things. <laughs> Forgive us for submitting that to you. See, they didn't need healing right now. 
And maybe things were going all right in their life and they didn't need that much encouragement. They forgot about the body. Amen. Amen. They only wanted the gift of the teacher. So what they'll do is they'll go find a teaching church. They'll find a teaching church where the guy's a teacher and that's all they'll get. But they'll miss the fullness. And you know if you only eat one food all the time, one, two things are going to happen. Number one, sooner or later you're going to get sick of that one food. It's not going to be special anymore. And number two... You're going to be unhealthy because you need protein, essential fats, and carbohydrates to survive. And if you take out one of those things from your diet, you're going to be a sick person. You're not going to be healthy. And so when we have the diet of the fullness. Now one thing we're doing, and we're going to be doing in the next 20 years in the Rock Churches, is we're going to be having a a greater revolving pulpit. We're already doing this in Columbus. It's a prototype church. We're launching this as a vision, but we're going to incorporate it more here and and, and in every other church. We want this pulpit to have a full diet. We need the apostle. We need, I'm an apostle. We need me, but we also need the prophetic. You know, we bring in prophet Kevin Leal several times a year and others of you who get up and have prophetic anointings and giftings and other men, Tony Kemp and some of these other guys that have prophetic anointings. We had uh, Kelly Brake in here a couple of weeks ago. He had a prophetic strong anointing. So we, we bring in that gift. We need the teacher. You know, we had Pastor Karen in here the other day teaching and she is a gifted revelatory teacher. Incredible gift. We have, we have Brian, who's an evangelist. He's the one that stirs you up. There isn't a time he comes that someone in here doesn't get touched by God, doesn't get healed by God, doesn't get delivered by God, doesn't get saved every time he comes. Just before service, a uh, uh, buddy was telling me out in the hall, he, he had a, a, a bad disc or something. He said, Pastor Brian grabbed him there two weeks ago and started doing this. And he said, I'm 100% better. better. Buddy Bonner just told me that right before service. I mean, I've heard testimony after testimony. A little boy who who was born and had to have part of his intestine removed. Gavin, right? There's mom and dad. Received a healing from God. He's what, 10 now? 11. How old was he when they removed his? He was nine days old. They removed part of his intestine. And he's had the manifestation of that ever since, right? Pastor Brian laid hands on him up here. I was in Brazil. I didn't see it, but they said he fell down and grabbed me. He said, my, my guts are filling up. And all of a sudden, he's having a manifestation now of, of healing. He's, he's having his digestive system work, which I'm not going to get too descriptive, but let's just say it's doing what it's supposed to do now. Amen. That's a miracle. And I'm sorry if, you know, someone wants to leave the church because they don't like that gift. But to see a little boy healed. I heard about Brooke and her, got metal in her hand and power of God hit her and she's bending her arm where it can't be bent because she had a dead bone disease. Man, power of God hitting everywhere. I just walked into a church in Brazil and the pastor got a phone call when I was with him and he said, it... He said, that's number three. And I said, number three what? He said, when Pastor Brian was here, there were three women in our church who could not conceive a child. And he prayed, and all three are pregnant six months later. All three are pregnant. (laughs) Hallelujah. We need the gift of the evangelist, signs, wonders, and miracles. We need the gift of the teacher. We need that teacher that can get down in our inner ear and unlock the mysteries of the kingdom of God to us. We need all these gifts, but we also need all these spiritual gifts. Amen. And to this, this morning, we're going to, let's, let's keep moving here. But each is given the manifestation. Everybody say, to each one is given. Verse 7. Pull it up there for me. Verse 7, but to each one is given. Everybody say, that would be me. me. Is anyone here not in each one? Okay, so you're all qualified, right? But to each one is given. See, we were taught many times only certain people can experience the power of God. To each one is given. Last night we were... 
we were practicing the laying on of hands in our service. And I was plucking people out that I see who usually are kind of bystanders. And I said, no, you get up here tonight and pray. And we had a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. And this morning we're going to be talking about the word of wisdom. And the word of wisdom. But to each one is given. To each one is given. Say, that would be me. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. You see, the Lord knew we needed help getting through life. And that's why Jesus said, it's very important that I leave. Because if I don't leave, the comforter won't come. And when he comes... He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance that I spoken to you. And he will bring these marvelous manifestation gifts. He will bring these beautiful gifts of the Spirit. And and you'll begin to have these manifestations among you, each one. Now, I was in church all my life and never saw one and never was one. You know why? I was taught wrong. People say, well, if God wants to do that, why didn't he do it for me? Because you have no faith. And the only way you procure anything from God, faith, is heaven's commerce. The exchange system between heaven and earth is not money. It's not works. It's faith. Some people say, well, if I do this, will that? No, it's faith. We have to believe it. If we don't believe it, it will not happen. We've got to believe it. You say, well, my faith is kind of weak. Okay, we brought in a teacher a while back, and he taught for days on the gift of faith and how faith works. And you can order the DVDs or the CDs from that and work on your faith. Develop your faith. If you're having a hard time believing that you or anyone else could have a divine endowment of supernatural power, then you need to get your faith trained up. You need to get your faith working. Because who wants a faithless Christian? Amen. Christianity is born of faith. To become a Christian, you have to believe in what you can't see. So why would you stop there? Amen. I mean, you believe in a Lord you can't see. You believe that he was born of a virgin that you didn't see. You believe that he fulfilled all those prophecies that you didn't see. You believe that he lived a perfect life that you didn't see. You believe that he was crucified, which you didn't see. You believe he was buried in a tomb that you didn't see. You believe he rose from the dead after three days, which you didn't see. You believe that he appeared unto over 500 people and taught them for 40 days that you didn't see. You believe that he was caught up to heaven in a cloud that you didn't see. You believe that some angels looked at the men and said, Why do you stand looking steadfast to heaven? This same Jesus who went up in a cloud will come down in a cloud that you didn't see. See, and you believe these men who were with him who went out and preached this gospel to the whole earth that you didn't see. You believe all that? You can't believe something like this? Give yourself a little more credit. Think about it. You got more faith than maybe you thought you did. But it might be that the enemy has sowed a seed in you to take your faith Of course in some areas. Some people say, well, I just don't think the gifts of the Spirit are that important. They won't be until you need one. An automobile is not a bit important to me until I need to go somewhere. You know what means nothing to me right now? Heat. Well, it's warm in here. (laughs) But come February, most important thing in this building will be those 28 furnaces. Amen. And when that heater breaks, the most important man in my Rolodex, in my iPhone index, is Sean Douglas. Sitting right back there. Because when he put all these furnaces in, his company did, and so one of them breaks, you know who the most important man in my life is that day? Sean Douglas. The heater's broke. We'll be there. When you need something, that's when it's important. Well, here's the thing. 
All of you are going to need something one of these nine gifts can give at some point in your life. So you need to really take heed and say, not only do I want to believe in these things, but I want to be a partaker of these things. And not only do I want to be a giver of these things, but I want to be a receiver of these things. Amen. Because these are the grace endowments of the Holy Spirit. So it says, to one is given through the Holy Spirit the power to speak a message of wisdom. A message of wisdom. How important is wisdom? Well, if you ever read the book of Proverbs, you would find out that wisdom is the most important thing in your life. Wisdom is the principal thing. And over and over in the Proverbs, it says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you wake up in the morning and you don't even think about what God's thinking about for you that day, then you're void of wisdom. If you wake up in the morning and you say, my number one priority in this life is to get today right with God, then now you're beginning to move in this gift of wisdom. And there are three manifestations, really, of wisdom. And these three manifestations of wisdom we can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go to verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. See, for some folks here this morning, I may be speaking right now, but it's like I'm speaking in another language. I was teaching like this down in Brazil the other day. And there was a lady in Brazil from the United States who was part of that team that week. But she wasn't walking in the fullness of these type of things. She was in a very strict denomination who doesn't believe these things. And I was teaching just like this, explaining things just line upon line, precept upon precept, very simple explanations. And after the service, she walked up to me and she said, I did not understand a word you said. I didn't understand a word you said. It was like you were speaking another language. And I was in awe. I was like, you're kidding. How could I have explained it any simpler? And then the scripture hit me. They have become dull of hearing. And they have eyes, but they can't see. And they have ears, but they can't hear. And they have hearts, but they can't understand. When we harden our hearts against the truth, when we say we're not going to believe part of the Bible, then we shut down. It's like we become deaf to that part of the kingdom of God. We become blind to that part of the kingdom of God. Jesus said they could not enter in because of unbelief. Amen. I said, why can't you just believe these things? I don't know. I just can't believe it. Well, you've locked yourself outside that door. And I'm sorry, but until you repent and become as a little child and you get converted again and you open your eyes up and you say, I just choose to believe the word of God, you'll stay blind. There may be people in here this morning and you say, I don't understand that stuff. You've made a choice to stay blind. In in the book of Hosea, God told Israel this, this message. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But then he didn't stop. He said, because they have rejected knowledge. It's not like God's not speaking. But some people make a decision not to hear. And when you make a decision not to hear and not to believe, you lock yourself outside that dimension of the Spirit. I want to be open to everything God has. I want to be open to all the Word of God. And I want to walk in His counsel. Amen? We speak wisdom among those who are mature. Not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age. Who are coming to nothing. A lot of people spend their whole life trying to learn stuff about this world. And it's nothing. Because when you die it's all gone. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom. Which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written... I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has done or has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us. How? Well, what if I'm not full of his spirit? 
That's what I sound like to you this morning if you're not filled with the Spirit. You're going to walk out and go, what did he say? What's he talking about? Why? So what, the first thing we need is the Holy Spirit. Why? He's the one who reveals all truth. Amen. We can't see without him. We can't hear without him. We can't understand without him. He is the interpreter of the things of God. I walked into a hotel in Brazil the other day. And as I walked in the hotel, there was a lady who was the, the owner of the hotel. And I had met her the last time I was there last year. And when I saw her, I, in, I, I got a word of God from her. And I looked at her and I went, hi. And she went, hi. And I went, and I walked away and I said, Lord, I got a word for her, but I have no interpreter. And inside me, I heard the Lord say, I got the same problem. I got all these people, but I got no way to speak to them because the Holy Ghost is the interpreter. I can't bring them light without the Holy Spirit, and they're rejecting Him. Amen, that's good. They're not giving Him the place in their hearts that He needs to have so they can work. And so later on, when I finally found an interpreter, and we went back and we were able to bring her the word of encouragement that we had, it was so funny because I, the first thing I said to her through my interpreter, and, and, he, and he, she spoke Portuguese, the first thing I said is, I said, I saw you the other day, but I couldn't say a word to you. And she answered back, and he interpreted me. I know I had the same problem. I wanted to speak to you. And then one day, one of the elders in, in, in the church we were ministering at, he came up to me and he pulled over an interpreter. And he was a guitar player on the worship team. And he said, I want to talk to you so bad, but I have no way to speak to you. And, and I, the interpreter said that to me. And I said, I feel the same way. <laughs> Thank God for interpreters. Amen. If you don't speak a language, you are without one, you're... you're, you're Completely, you're worthless. <laughs> you can't communicate. And the Holy Spirit is the interpreter between human brains and kingdom of God. Amen. And that's why we need him more than anything else. So he gives us this word of wisdom. What man knows the things of a man, verse 11, except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so... None of us knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Do you know Peter said it this way? In 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, Unto us have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. But we have to be able to hear that. Amen. We've got to be able to assimilate that. That's why some people, they don't know whose they are. They walk in the world, they live in the world just as a human being and a human doing. And Paul rebuked the church. He said, you're behaving like mere men. Don't you know what you've been given? Amen. No, I don't. And that's why we have to seek him with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our soul, and all of our strength. That's why every day we should be waking up saying, Holy Spirit, show me the things that I cannot see today. Let me hear the things that I cannot hear. And let my heart grasp the truths of your kingdom. Let my heart be in oneness with you today. And one of the gifts he gives is this beautiful word of wisdom. Now he goes on to say that these things we also speak... Not in words, look at this. Now, this is one of the kinds of wisdom. Not in words that man's wisdom teaches. So one of the three sources of wisdom is man. Man. There's a man's wisdom in the world. And some people have wisdom in certain areas of life. And, and they have that wisdom. It's human wisdom. It's just a knowing of how to do things, a knowing of what to do. But these things are not man's wisdom... 
but which the Holy Spirit teaches. You say, Dave, why do you always stand up there and say, well, let's ask our teacher to come? Because I believe this. Amen. I don't believe I can teach you the things of God. I can only be a conduit for him to flow through. But I'm not going to stand up here and say, I, Dave Chisholm, can teach you the kingdom of God. I cannot. Amen. I can't teach it. And here's the other side. You can't learn it Amen. without him. So we're working in a partnership with the Holy Spirit. If he's not speaking through me and he's not listening in you and helping you understand it because what he does is he compares spiritual things with spiritual. You remember Jesus came into the world and it says without a parable he would not speak unto them. What did I just do in the last five minutes? I gave you a parable about an interpreter and that was comparing a spiritual thing with a spiritual thing. Just like you can't communicate on earth to someone who speaks another language, you can't communicate in heaven with out heaven with heaven's language without an interpreter that was me being used by the holy spirit that was a spontaneous unction no plan nothing in my notes i'm not even reading notes the only thing in my notes is scriptures it's the holy spirit popping up a parable what is a parable an earthly illustration of a heavenly truth Jesus never taught without a parable. You give a principle, then you give a parable. That's how we learn about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a man who sowed seed in a field. The kingdom of God is like a man who threw out a great fish net. The kingdom of God is like a woman who lost a coin. The kingdom of God is like a certain judge. The kingdom of God... Over and over, Jesus used these earthly illustrations. If you want to be a teacher of the Bible, you must learn how to access the parable wisdom of God. Amen. How many of y'all ever been to a boring church service? How many of y'all would say, it's not today? <laughs> I'm watching. <laughs> You know, I had, the other day, we, 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 we were in Brazil, and at, after the meetings were done, we finished the final meeting, uh, uh, one of the, the, the leaders of the church came up and said, I could have sat here all night and listened. Why? Because I'm accessing heaven, and you're receiving heaven. We're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The most effective communicators in the kingdom are the communicators who use parables, illustrations, props. You know what? We're in, we're in Columbus Friday. We're working on building a floor. And I'm singing. And you know what I'm singing? The Holy Ghost will take the chicken out of you. The Holy Ghost will take the chicken out of you. And I'm laughing at myself. Because I'm singing this little kid's song from that puppet ministry they did last Sunday. I'm singing that song six days later because that was a parable. It was something you could learn from and you would remember. They will forget certain things, but the parables are what they will remember. And the Bible says, without a parable, he would not speak unto them. And so Jesus used parables. And that's how the communion. Wisdom is in taking a heavenly truth and making it a reality in a person's heart. And the way God uses that gift of wisdom is through parables. Let me give you a great illustration. There were two women, and they each had a newborn child. And one of the women rolled over in the middle of the night and suffocated her baby. The other woman, she, she brought the other woman and her baby before the king. And she said, the other woman, it was her baby. It was her baby that died. And she stole my baby. And the king had no way of knowing which was the right mother. Had no way of knowing. And so the king said, Bring me a sword 
and cut the baby in half and give half to this mother and half to this mother. The one mother said, no, no, let the other mother have the baby. He said, give the baby to her. She's the mother. The other woman said, go ahead and cut it in half. He knew that was a gift of wisdom operating in the wisest man besides Jesus that ever lived. His name was Solomon. He wrote the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. See, that was a gift of wisdom, knowing what to do and how to do it. And many lack wisdom. We all need more, but some need more than others. Amen, because they have less than others. Now, wisdom is something we can gain from God. Wisdom is, you know, uh, most of you will identify with what I'm about to say. There are some people, they are as intellectually, if you give them an IQ test, they're the smartest people on the earth, but they're dumber than a box of hammers when it comes to practical things in life. We call it common sense. Some people have an intellectual ability, but they have no common sense. Common sense is a synonym for wisdom. They just got common sense. They just know how to do things. They just know what to do and when to do it. They know what to say. How many of y'all know people that have the foot and mouth disease? They always say the wrong thing at the wrong time. They have no discretion. They can't judge when someone is rejecting them or accepting them, and they cause rejection upon themselves because of it. Wisdom gives us discretion. Another synonym is prudence. These are all synonyms. This wisdom, here's the good news. You didn't have to be born with a certain brain capacity. You can be intellectually not that smart, but yet walk in the wisdom of God. Because this wisdom does not come from human intellect. It comes as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Knowing what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. The word discretion means to be able to do something with as little offense as possible. There's a lot of times people cause unnecessary offenses because they lack discretion. I believe today one of the most, the greatest manifestations of the lack of the spirit of wisdom is the lack of discretion among God's people. There's a, there's a time to speak, and the Bible says there's a time to be still. Amen. Some people just speak, 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 and they don't know. You passed your point a long time ago. Amen. So we've got to know what these gifts are. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, verse 14 The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. We have people come in this church all the time and they see us prophesying or speaking in tongues or praying for someone to be delivered or healed. And to them it's like, well, that's a bunch of foolishness. It is to you because you have no wisdom. You have no understanding of the kingdom of God. You're a human being and human doing. And that's it. You only have man's wisdom. You don't have the wisdom of God. But yet you judge as if you do. And you lock yourself out of the kingdom. And that's a curse on the earth. And it's a curse in families. It's generational unbelief. It's a huge curse in our nation. That's been propagated by carnal preachers. By preachers who don't even believe the Bible they preach and teach. Preachers who don't live the word of God, but instead they're hypocrites. They're professional actors, and they can fool the best of them. He says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. People come into this church every year. And I hear this testimony. I've heard it every year since I started teaching full-time in ministry 28 years ago. Here's the testimony. I've learned more in one year in this church than I learned in 20 years or 30 years or 10 years in another church. Why? Because I exalt the teacher and they don't. They study to get inspiration. I pray to get inspiration. They go to a book. I go to the writer of the book. 
I believe without him I can do nothing and you can do nothing. And they believe they're just so smart and that's why people come to hear him speak. And they're the, you know, they, they, they're the fulfillment of this scripture. And so they become a bunch of spiritual midgets. Oompa Loompa people. In lollipop land. It goes on to say the natural man, he can't do it. They're foolishness. But look at verse 15. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The gift of the word of wisdom is the application of knowledge that God gives us. This type of wisdom is a gift that cannot be gained through study and experience. It can't. You can try to replace it with that, but it doesn't work. This is a gift that comes from God's perspective. It's a Christian gift that begins to develop out of the fear of God in a human heart. And it's an impartation. You can't say, because I went to seminary, I have the gift of wisdom. There are more dumb preachers graduating seminary. Ain't got a power to blow the shell off a peanut. <laughs> they're empty heads. They're, they're powerless. They got more degrees than a thermometer. But they've got no power in their life. There's no authority. They've never cast out a devil. They've never manifested a gift of the Holy Ghost. When I walk into a church and I'm looking for a spiritual leader, the first thing I'm going to do is say, are you spiritual? And then if they answer me and say, yeah, I've got a doctorate from Deadhead Seminary, I'm going to say, are you spiritual? Well, I've got a, a, an MBA in theology. Are you spiritual? Are you spiritual? What do you mean? You're not. You just answered my question. You ever cast out a devil? Well, now, in this church, we really don't believe that uh, uh, Christians, you know, need deliverance from death. You just answered my question. You ever speak in tongues? Well, no, you know, when the apostle Paul died, those gifts were taken. You just answered my question. Next! The first way you qualify a spiritual leader is that he's supposed to be spiritual. If he doesn't move in the gifts of the Spirit, operate in the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Next, you need to go back to school, except not Bible school. You need to go back to the school on your knees, and you need to find the heart and the presence of God. Because it isn't your intellect that's going to deliver someone from generational insanity. It's the power of God. You're not going to deliver this generation from heroin addiction. It's going to take the power of God. It isn't going to happen through intellect. You can th one thing our government's learning, you can throw all the money you want at sin. It don't fix it. Our government thinks, oh, we got a problem with drugs. Let's just fund an anti-drug program. That ain't working. Our nation is going broke. But the drug addicts is now at a new high epidemic level. Why? You can't throw money at sin. There's only one thing that delivers man from the power of sin, and that's the power of the Son of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God the Father. Nothing else works. So this gift of wisdom, it's a revealing of prophetic futures. It is a speaking of hidden truths that's not known. It's a supernatural perspective of the divine. It's a means of accomplishing God's will in a given situation. It is divinely given power to appropriate spiritual intuition in problem solving. Furthermore, this gift involves having a sense of divine direction. Being led by the spirit to act appropriately at a given time. Knowing what to say and when to say it. Knowing how to move and when not to move. That's what wisdom is. And it's a gift. It's a super, imp, 
supernatural impartation of facts, not a learning of facts from the natural. You can't earn it. It's a gift that comes through prayer. Ephesians chapter 1. That's why I prayed this prayer every day. I got on my knees year after year and I prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we might know the hope of His calling and what are the riches of His glory to the inheritance of saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of that power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places and I prayed and I prayed and I cried out to God and it came and now I walk with sight other people don't have and they say well, you must be special no I begged God for wisdom I was as dumb as anybody but I took this serious. Amen. And I cried out to him. And he came. And he rained wisdom on me. And when I was 26 years old, I was building churches. And I had 65-year-old men walking up saying, I can't believe I'm submitting to a 26-year-old as my spiritual father. There are people in this room older than me. And you're submitting to me as a father. I should be your son. Now there is a gift of apostle in me, and that's for building the church. But there's just a gift of wisdom. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't have it before. I was a drug addict. How wise is that? I was an alcoholic. How wise was that? I was a whoremonger. How wise was that? I lived to please my flesh. How wise is that? But I cried out to God day and night. And I said, I won't stop until you bless me. I wrestled with the angel of God to the breaking of the day. And he said, let me go. And I said, no, I'll not let you go until you bless me. I will not stop crying out day and night until the rain of heaven comes on this dry and thirsty heart. And he comes. Amen. That's the only reason Amen. that I walk in wisdom. That's the only reason people ask my advice. It's because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that I can't control. It's a gift that moves at its own will. It's divinely inspired of the Spirit. It's divinely controlled of the Spirit. I say things at times I don't even know I say. Amen. It's a gift, and you can have the gift too. You just got to be as serious about it as I was. Someone said, you want, you want wisdom? Read the book of Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. Read one chapter a day, and in one month you'll read it. I thought, why do that? Let's just read the book a day. And so I read the book of Proverbs every day. The whole book, all 31 chapters, month after month after month. And then when I started having wisdom, people say, wow, you must be a gift of God. I said, no, I cried out. And I believed the scripture that said, thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you, O God. How shall a young man cleanse his way, the psalmist cried, by taking heed according to your word. When the Bible says, don't do something, I didn't do it. You're awful smart. No, I just read. Amen. The only difference between me and you is I believe what I read. Amen. And you just go on about your business like, and just go on about my business like nothing ever happened. I know the Bible says not to do that, but I'm different. I'm special. I know the Bible says we're not supposed to have sex till we get married, but I'm special. God knows my needs. You're an idiot. You're a pervert. Now, that may not have been discretion. Because if you're sleeping with someone you ain't married to right now, I might have just offended you up in this house. Good. You needed to be offended, you pervert. I had a woman come up to me the other day and said, you know, you shouldn't have said that. Why not? Is it the truth? Yeah. Is that what Jesus would have said? Yeah. But we're, we shouldn't say the things Jesus said. We shouldn't tell people you're going to hell if you don't repent. Why not? That's what he said. He said we're going to, you're going to hell if you don't repent. Folks, today, and I close with this scripture. Here's what the Bible says. James chapter 1. 
My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many of y'all are doing that? Knowing the, faith, the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Look at this, guys, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. I think the only thing that separates me from a lot of people is I ask. Amen. A lot of people assume and I ask. A lot of people are just in passing and I was fervent in my desire. I really do want to have wisdom. When I read the story of Solomon and how the Spirit of God came to him and said, ask whatever you want and it will be given you. You know what he said? Give me a heart to rule your people. Give me wisdom to rule your people. God said, because you've asked for this and not the other, you'll get that and everything else. See, that's, that's why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is, the word principle means first law or prince over all law. Principle, first law, the first thing you need is wisdom. Upon the foundation of wisdom, God can build an awesome life. But without the foundation of wisdom, all your blessings will come crumbling down around you at some point. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. Stand with me in this house this morning. We're going to pray right now. And we're going to ask God. Now, now the Bible says this. Jesus said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. If you heard this message this morning... And if you believe in your hearts that wisdom is a gift from the Holy Spirit, then I want you to access the bank of heaven today. And you have an account with heaven. And you have made deposits into your account by faith. And now you have a freedom and liberty to make a withdrawal of wisdom. We give God our faith. God gives us His wisdom. We give God our faith. He gives us his wisdom. James went on to say, but when you ask, do not be double-minded. You can't ask and not and say, well, I don't know if I got it or not. You didn't. It says, let him ask believing. A double-minded man is as unstable. He's unstable in all his ways. We got to ask, and the day I believe I've preached a message from the Holy Spirit, and I believe He's given you an impartation of faith to believe this message, and now we access the account of heaven. We access the treasuries in Him. The Scripture says are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Him are hidden. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Him are hidden. All the treasures. And today, God has asked us, come into the treasury. Come in and shop for wisdom. Come in and look around. Where do you need wisdom? Where do you lack wisdom? Some of you that are single, you need wisdom in the next person you commit your life to. Some of you who are, are unemployed, you need wisdom on how you're going to make a way in the earth. Some of you who are young and don't have a career, you need wisdom in understanding what God put you on this earth to do. Some of you are trying to figure out where you fit in the kingdom and in the church. You need wisdom to discover the gifts of where you fit in the kingdom of God. And so now, if you believe, open your mouth and begin to ask the Father who gives liberally. The Bible says he, when He gives it, He's not going to rebuke you for it. He says He doesn't upbraid with it. He longs for you to do what is right. And he longs for you to acknowledge him in all things, that he may direct your steps. The path of a righteous man is ordered of the Lord. The light of 
the, the candle of the Lord is the spirit of a man. And so the Lord wants to direct your paths. He wants to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. He wants to help you make wise choices and wise decisions in everything you do. I'm crying out to God every day. Lord, let us choose the right people. Lord, let us make the right financial decisions. Lord God, we don't want to make a mistake in your kingdom. We don't want to overextend and we don't want to be timid where we should be overextending. We don't want to walk in foolishness and presumption, but we want to walk in wisdom and counsel and admonition. We want to walk in the wisdom of God. We want to walk in the wisdom of God. Now, if you really want wisdom, you got to ask, you got to seek, you got to knock. And the Bible says it will be given to you, the door will be opened, and you will find. Hallelujah. This is not a promise of David Chisholm, who is a man who could lie. This is a promise of Almighty God, who is not a man and cannot lie. He said it. I'm just repeating his words. He stands bound by his word. You can't hold me accountable to God's word. I can't hold you accountable to God's word. He is accountable for his own words. And he said, I will watch over my word to perform it. And not one word that is spoken from my lips will fall to the ground void. But it will bring forth the thing in which I called it to do. And God's calling out to you. Deep is crying unto deep this morning. Will you acknowledge him in all your ways? Will you acknowledge him in all your ways? Today, Lord, we commit. If you want to commit, lift up your voice and tell him. Today, Father, I commit. I commit my way unto the Lord. Your word says, if I commit my way unto you, my thoughts will be established. My steps will be directed. You will keep my heart in perfect peace. As it, my mind is stayed upon you. And today, Father, I cry out. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. I want your wisdom, God. More than silver or gold. More than fame or success. More than any earthly pleasure. I want to walk in wisdom, discernment, discretion, and prudence. Understanding. Let me walk in that strength. The power of your might. Give it to me, Father. Give it to me, Father. You promised you would. And I receive it now. I have now received today an impartation from the divine wisdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit as the Word of God has been taught. I am a disciple. And I learn the ways of God today. Thank you, Father, for this unspeakable gift. I receive it. And I will walk today with a new understanding of your kingdom and the ways of your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord, for this wonderful thing. Hallelujah. Could I get my prayer team up here, please? Today, if you're in this place and you have a need in your heart, you have something that you need someone to agree with you in prayer about. We want to pray with you before you leave today. These are people who've been taught the Word of God. They know how to pray the prayer of faith. They know how to access the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge. These are people that have been tested and tried. Their character has been proven. And they're walking in the ways of God. Or they would not be up here. They would not be up here. 
And so we trust and we, as the scripture says, we confess our faults one to another. We pray for one another that we may be healed. So if you need prayer today before you leave, please come and get prayer. I want to thank you so much for coming. And I want to challenge you in the next seven days. I'm going to challenge you to get up every morning and cry out for the wisdom of God. The discernment of God. The gift of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Acknowledge Him every day when you wake up. Just hug Him. Say wisdom. The Bible says call out to her. Call out to her. The wisdom refers to a, a, a feminine spirit. When, it, when the Bible talks, it calls wisdom a her. And it says cry out to her. I don't understand how all that works with God, but I'm just going to do what the book says. And it says call her your sister. Call her your nearest relative. Cry out to wisdom. And let wisdom come and fill your heart. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Next week we're going to be teaching on the word of knowledge. Because knowledge and wisdom are two different things. And then the next week we'll be going into discerning of spirits. And the next week, faith and miracles and healing signs and wonders all these great gifts of the spirit have an awesome awesome week in the lord if you need prayer come and get it